Good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. If you are watching us from elsewhere in the world or indeed reflecting uh, back on the recording. My name is Martin Spoprinskis. I am a reader in public international law at University College London, and I'm the host and chair of tonight's event, uh, The Practice of Public International Law as a Government Legal Advisor, Reflections. Now, it has been advertised as a fireside chat in the uh, anteroom, as it were, we were reflecting because one of the speakers' great fields of expertise is environmental law, that perhaps a different metaphor uh, than an exercise that releases carbon should be thought for such activities. But nevertheless, I very much look forward to tonight's talk. I will introduce um, the speaker in a minute. Let me just first uh, remind you of the format and the expectations of the discussion. Uh, we will discuss uh, in a very free-flowing format uh, the formidable experience of Daniel Ayo in uh, various fields of international law. And I very strongly encourage uh, the listeners who I already have already joined in impressive numbers to actively ask questions through the Q and A uh, box. So uh, this is not, this is emphatically not one of those events where you should save up your questions until the very end, although we will have a Q&A option at the very end. Please ask them as they arise to you, and I will try to incorporate them in the conversation. So having made that point, let me uh, introduce uh, the speaker whose biography is long and illustrious. And as we agreed, I will be very brief with that. Uh, Daniele is currently an adjunct senior research fellow at the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore, a well-known powerhouse of international law in Asia and the world, and also a visiting researcher at the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law, also at NUS, and a senior advisor at a boutique strategic consulting firm. Daniele comes to us with over 25 years of public sector experience as a public international law practitioner in Singapore, most recently as a deputy director general at the International Affairs Division of the Singapore Attorney General's Chambers, where she worked on a variety for fields and led Singapore's negotiating team on some of the key uh, multilateral negotiations. One of her fields of particular expertise I mentioned is international environmental law. I think I'm probably not the only one in the audience who uh, sought information about the recent Glasgow COP from her insightful uh, videos. And here, just to note, because dispute settlement will be one of the themes that we will address. She also served as an elected alternate member of the Implementation and Compliance uh, Committee of the Paris Agreement. Well, it is really, really, really wonderful uh, to have Daniele with us. Um, let me begin perhaps uh, with a somewhat provocative opening question. Uh, sometimes when I talk with my uh, colleagues in international academia, or they're hastening at none of those at UCL, there's a bit of suspicion and uncertainty about the role that international law uh, plays in governmental legal advisory work. And I think particularly in those fields where we have lots of courts and tribunals, there's a sense that, well, that is all ex post facto justificatory work, unlikely that it would play a uh, much role in actual decision making. So what is, as it were, the real world? Thank you, Martin. And, and first, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, and to share the insights as a, a recently former public international law government legal advisor. And of course, I should caveat the views I express here are purely personal opinions and certainly do not reflect those of my current or former organization. And you've asked a very provocative starting question. And, and, and that actually was a question that I was confronted with. Um, in my early days in a career, and I remember a very senior colleague actually asked the question, is an international lawyer really a lawyer? And what do you really do? And so I think there is a, a lot of the mystery over what the PIL lawyer does. Uh, but I I'm happy to say, I think that at least after 20 years, 
a little bit of that mystery has been lifted. Um, so what is the role and the guiding precept of a public international law government legal advisor? Um, I'm sure there will be a spectrum of possible responses to this question, and I can, of course, only speak for myself. Um, the context, I think, is also very important because I think one needs to understand where the legal department sits within the domestic constitutional structure, which can, of course, certainly differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. My own experience is a legal counsel with the Attorney General's chambers. And in Singapore, this was an independent organ of state, not part of the executive or the legislative branch. And I constantly had to perhaps correct uh, uh, colleagues or counterparts who've asked, is your boss the minister of law, for instance? And I said, no, of course not. Uh, it is a completely different organ of state. Uh, but that is not the case in many in other jurisdictions. And that is not the case for a public international lawyer who may reside within a particular ministry, but is charging public international law functions within a political ministry and therefore reporting to a particular minister. So I think the context, as I say, is quite important. For example, um, and what I mentioned, uh, what I described as a structure in Singapore, is a structure you see um, in other jurisdictions in, in Asia. Uh, it is the system in, say, Brunei, it is the system in Malaysia, for instance. But you see a different structure in other countries like Australia or New Zealand, where the public national law practitioners actually sit within, the, say, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, for instance, uh, and with, with some situated within the Attorney General's Chambers in Australia. So it is very different. Um, and again, in the US, you have the trade law, public international lawyers sitting within the USCR. So again, the structure is different. But regardless of where the public international lawyer resides, if the government uh, or officer resides, I see the role primarily really as one of protecting and advancing the interests of the government or the country rather that you represent. Um, and it's a simple line, but it, it belies a lot of what, what happens behind closed doors, what happens behind the scenes. Um, I see international law as a way, or, or should I say, you, one would will, a public international law practitioner wills international law as a sword and as a shield. And I'll explain a little what I mean by that. So you will international law as a sword and a shield to advance the interests of the country or the state that you represent. But there are also other important aspects of the role. You also wield it as a pen. Um, to map and to chart out new routes, um, new, new boundaries, uh, new discoveries, because that's the nature of public international law. It is very, um, this is a very evolutionary uh, discipline of law, which can grow and develop over time. Not by way necessarily of a legislation that you pass in a parliament. There is no world parliament, so to speak. Uh, but nonetheless, a public international law is in fully in a position to influence and to chart the and write the law, is one could put it that way. Uh, and of course, the last role of a public international lawyer, uh, which is sometimes uh, uh, forgotten in debate, is very much as a diplomat. You operate in the international sphere, you're conducting international relations through the power of law, but you essentially also uh, function as a diplomat because you're representing the state and what you say and do uh, conveys a position of the state. So these are really primarily the roles. And, and I would then try and elaborate um, what I mean by this. Uh, if one approaches this question from a very obvious descriptive sense, the role is actually in essence quite similar to that of a government legal advisor uh, advising on domestic law. Uh, you advise on the rights and obligations with regard to an intended course of action, or in this case, perhaps an intended policy move you act in similarly, you act as a negotiator, but instead of a contract, you're negotiating a treaty to achieve the desired outcomes. And similarly to a lawyer in a domestic context and a government lawyer in a government domestic context, you will also have responsibilities for managing disputes, resolving disputes, uh, what you mentioned at the start of your talk, uh, of, of your comments, that you, know, you think of an having international lawyer in at the end, but that's not the case. In fact, most of the work happens in the first phases and less so at the last phases for a gen for a typical 
a government public international lawyer. Now, of course, the emphasis Martin should differ depending on the particular institution or the structure in different jurisdictions, as I mentioned. Um, you know, in my organization, I would have previous organization, I would have operated across all three spheres. Um, fortunately, not all, not all at the same time, <laughs> because if that happens, uh, you know, basically, uh, you can imagine the, the level of commitment and the level of uh, 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 stress that will place on your time and your, and your, and your, and your, and your attention. But this is again not uncommon in Asia in the setup. So again, depending on the portfolio assigned, you may be handling live negotiations alongside a live dispute. So that's uh, the unpredictability of a, of a life of a public international law. Well, now, that is really, really fascinating and really helpful. And I think that this is something that we can really take in a, in a, in a number of directions. And, and I think that I mentioned that one, one, one paper that I had a look at when I was preparing for this talk was a recent speech uh, given by uh, Judge Donahue, uh, President of the International Court of Justice in late October to the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly. And sort of one of the top, and the topic was the roles of international judge and foreign ministry lawyer. President Donahue made a number of very interesting comparative observations, which related to the particular framing, but in the process, she also uh, made a number of interesting points about specifically the legal advisors work. And, and I think perhaps sort of one of the more uh, general points, and I wondered, you know, perhaps it's in a way, it's sort of, it's, it's the obvious point uh, between uh, lawyers and policy makers, but I imagine that the uh, it plays out uh, interestingly in practice. So if I may quote a bit from Judge Donahue, she says, uh, I quote, uh, a legal advisor to a government has a client, the state. Uh, ministers personify that client at any given time, setting the direction of the state's policies, which then play an important role in framing the questions uh, that the legal advisor faces. And she says a few other things, and then she concludes, uh, the existence of the client does mean that the focus of the legal advice is to enable the ministers to pursue objectives that they set in a manner that is consistent with the legal advisor's appreciation of the law. So I wonder again, in a very open-ended sense, whether that is consistent with your experience. Um, absolutely. Uh, I would definitely agree with uh, Judge Donahue's comments. Um, that is very much reflective of my experience um, as a government advisor, particularly in this area. Um, you're not there. I see it really as a um, as an advisor in particular, the function of an advisor. I really see it as a, a sort of a robust partnership, uh, collaboration with the policy branch of the government. Um, and to be a good legal advisor, you have to take the time to really um, understand the policy measure, understand the intended policy outcome and then situate that within the parameters of the applicable legal framework. So in other words, you know, advising, litigating legal risk, it's not just a question of whether, yes, you can implement this measure or no, you can't, but really your role is to work hand in hand. And I see my role at, at that time as working hand in hand uh, to really suggest refinements if need be to the measure or to advise against the measure if need be uh, in, in, for, for reasons of consistency. Uh, with the public international law framework and really what is your obligations, for example, in the trade field, you know, would imposing the measure uh, until a breach of the WTO or FTA obligation. Um, it can really involve many rounds of engagement with policy agencies. And so the art of interaction, the art of um, being able to collaborate uh, and work in a collaborative relationship increasingly becomes important. Um, and, and I don't remember this being the case when I first started out. Uh, it was a, a much more different sort of relationship uh, between the lawyers, I think, and in, in the, in the policy agents. Uh, but you have seen, I have seen that evolution over time because policy making is just more complex. Um, and there is a need for the lawyers to put on without intruding into the policy making space. I mean, your role is very clear. You're a lawyer, you're not a policy maker but you need to be able to understand where the policy guys are coming from um, and then translate your legal advice in a way that's practical, 
that's tangible and that's implementable. Uh, I think that is the key. At the end of the day, they take the final decision. You still have to be very robust in flagging out the risk. Uh, and increasingly, not just the international law risk, but you know, where it, it, it intersects with uh, domestic or constitutional law issues, you also need to be able uh, to pick that up. The, the basic point here is that international law doesn't exist in a, in, in a vacuum or sort of a superstructure. You know, the, the international law has to be very much aware of the domestic framework in order to be effective. Again, that I think that, that is fascinating and um, and 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 extremely extremely insightful. Um, I think sort of lots of lots of mental footnotes and points that will will pick up. I so I wondered about sort of again to follow one one judge Judge Donahue's point, um, uh, which I think sort of may have been perhaps sort of implicit in some of the things. Uh, so the idea of the state as a as a repeat player, uh, and sort of the likelihood that states will be around for a long time, uh, that on any legal issue that they are likely to come from one side and the other, and I think the so the example, if I could again quote from her speech, comes from um, extradition law. So a very peculiar one, but I'm sure that. Uh, that there could be other examples in other fields. And Judge Onohue says, I quote, the legal advisor must look forward, mindful of the possible presidential implications of the position to be taken on a particular matter. If one interpretation of an extradition treaty would support your state's request that the treaty partner extradite individual to your country, you can be expected to point out to your ministers that the same provision applies to extradition from your country. Uh, to the treaty partner, uh, and and I wonder whether you have sort of the whether the particular role of the long term multiple perspectives repeat player, you know, any thoughts on how that plays out? Um, absolutely, it does complicate uh, your life a little bit, but personally, I find that the really one of the more challenging um, and rewarding parts of your role uh, because it requires a vision that broad. Um, a good public international law legal practitioner, um, in my mind, needs to have a very strong foundation in the general uh, aspects of public international law. Because you do need to be able to um, identify the issues and join the dots. Um, and that typically, that example that was given uh, by Judge Nohi is exactly an example where the states are long-term players in the international law sphere. Um, Every action, word, and deed that is expressed uh, remains, especially for days, in perpetuity. A good researcher will be able to find out um, and understand what positions have been taken by the state in the past. Um, and so in any advice that's given, it needs to be calibrated uh, both sides. So what I mean by a sword and a shield is precisely this point. If you want to take a position, you must also remember what the if you take too strong a robust a position, could this have unintended consequences down the line? Let me give an example. The extradition is an uh, example is an excellent example, um, and and it is increasingly uh, contentious area nowadays. But let me give an another example in the which may be uh, I, I hope a contemporary one that can re that many in the room can relate to. Um, I am sure I can well imagine um, that many international law advisors, and in fact, probably even domestic uh, government advisors, were called upon to advise on the consistency of measures precipitated by the COVID crisis. So for example, we saw um, in the early days of the crisis, given the shortages, um, announcements of restrictions on bans on the export of personal protective equipment to safeguard supplies um, in the domestic, that are needed in the domestic market. If you were on the receiving end of these measures, you would want to utilize international law as, I would say crudely, but as a sword to challenge those measures because you want to ameliorate the effects in order to have access to those PPE products as well. If you were the country that needed those products to be exported to you. But if you're advising the states that needs to impose those measures, you will want to look to international law as a shield 
to justify the defensibility of those measures. So you want to be able to prevent or restrict, let's say, the export. Now, both positions, if you take a step back, are perfectly rational and understandable given the really emergency crisis precipitated. I mean, one can understand and you cannot fault the policy um, intentions and motivations behind trying to ensure enough supplies for your population. But how do you do that in a way that doesn't infringe international law, uh, human rights law, trades law? And so the advice you give must also allow, um, let's say, uh, a, a measure of flexibility and a measure of defensibility should the shoe fall on the other foot. Because one day you could be the uh, on the other receiving end of an export ban, but the next day you, be, you may be the country that needs to impose some sort of restrictions because you face a certain emergency for another category of products, not PPE, but some other category of products. Um, and the same principle you know, in which in, will apply. What are the conditions? What are the criteria? When can you impose such measures? So uh, the international law does have to be very alert and mindful of, of these. Um, and this is just one dimension, right? You're operating in the trade field, but there are principles which operate outside of the trade, not just within the trade field, uh, but beyond, right? When we talk about um, security exceptions, when we talk about the assessment of necessity, it can come up um, in disciplines other than trade. So, so that is also another issue that one needs to be mindful of. Uh, but I simply think it makes life quite interesting for a public international law. Right, uh, and and I think that this, um, uh, I think that sort of brings us neatly, perhaps if a bit sideways, to to one related point again, uh, something that uh, uh, Judge Donahue noted. So I think I'm really uh, sort of almost glossing uh, on her uh, speech with such great insights, and that is the idea of, um, I suppose, keeping in mind both the foundational assumptions and rules that are common to all fields uh, mm -hmm. and also being attuned to the subfields and so what she said was i quote in my experience as a government lawyer i also found great value in being a generalist in public international law uh, someone who has broad knowledge of the entire field and a sufficiently deep understanding of each of the subfields to be able to delve into a precise question in a probing and insightful way in negotiating treaties in one subfield, for example, I was often able to draw inspiration from approaches followed in treaties in another subfield. So again, I think I, I, I would really be fascinated to hear sort of your perspective, I guess, both on the sort of the general specialist tension and the idea of, sort of the fruitful crossovers between different specialist ones. Um, I will take the, the, the response in two levels. Um, first from the individual and then second from the point of view of the government. Um, from the internet individual perspective, um, I think there is room to be one or the other or both. Um, because as an individual, um, depending on which discipline you want to be, um, there is value in being a, a deep specialist in uh, an expert in one area, but recognizing that perhaps you lack the expertise in a general area and work in tandem with a generalist public international lawyer. In the same way, a generalist public international lawyer uh, also needs to have the modesty to recognize that they may not be the deep experts in certain fields and are able to collaborate with them. Um, my, personally, my personal journey, um, you know, because of the number of years we've been practiced in this area, my personal journey and my personal preference is really to be a generalist public international lawyer, to give me that breath. But, um, but um, uh, over the course of time, developing deeper specialties in certain areas, so be it trade law, be it security, or be it climate change and environmental law. But, you, but personally, I do think a foundation is, is important for any public international law um, to be able to exercise uh, that way. But obviously, um, if, if, if I would certainly agree with Judge Shonish's comment that you know, if you're going to be, if, if, you're, if your objective or your your, your, your ambition, let's put it that way, um, is to perhaps uh, aspire to be a ICJ judge, then certainly I think that breath uh, is 
is critical, as well as uh, the deeper, deeper specialties in certain South areas. But from the point of view of the government, uh, they will need both sets of expertise for sure, because the government cannot function in vacuum. And um, having sets of specialties within your organization uh, will prevent uh, blind sites from developing, one would hope. That, that is very helpful. I, I, I mean, I wonder, so I think that you have identified some of the fields in which you have particularly worked, uh, trade, uh, security, environment, climate change, uh, and all three very, very sophisticated fields where people have spent a great deal of time thinking about them, but really it was very different institutional assumptions, uh, very different assumptions, I suppose, in a loose sense of the normal way of doing things. Um, and, and I wonder sort of, or sort of perhaps again, uh, you know, whether it sort of, it makes, whether there are still, as it were, islands within the broader sea of international law, um, or whether mechanisms like CPTPP or uh, conference of parties run multilateral environmental agreements or, you know, very deeply political elaboration of uh, rules on cyberspace, mm. whether they are so deeply specialized that that in a way that kind of that the generalist backdrop ceases to provide a great deal of assistance that you really have to dive straight into them. Mm, it's um it's a difficult question because I have mulled over that myself, um, having operated across those fields, um, and even though there may be sort of a sui generis, almost like a sui generis, a sui generis um, disciplines, let's say within uh, the climate change, right? You look at it in terms of what is in the UF FCCC, what is in the Paris Agreement. Uh, but increasingly, my sense is that, again, the public international lawyer um, has, continues to have relevance in this space. Um, and it's in fact a necessary part of this space. It is about complementing the sales sets, and each country may have their own uh, structure and their own way of, of doing that. Uh, and why do I say this? Uh, for example, when if you look at um, climate change and uh, environmental, uh, let's just say climate change, okay? so that's, that's a real example of a subspecialty even within the environmental fields. Um, honestly, I do see them as being built on top of the foundations and layered on top of the existing international law framework. Um, because if you look at the Paris Agreement, uh, you know, traditionally in the past, and based on my understanding and, and, and study, the agreement, the negotiation agreement was very much uh, featured a lot of involvement of uh, I would say te technical negotiators and science and policy. Uh, and perhaps unusually for a treaty, uh, less, uh, less legal counsel in comparison. There were still legal counsels, but you know, it, it, the, 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 the demarcation is a little bit different from, from what we see in other treaties. Now, does that mean it's a self-contained regime? Because it does have a very uh, technical, very complex transparency obligations. Uh, what they call the monitoring, reporting, verification process. And now after, uh, after Glasgow, again, a very technical Article 6 carbon market trading mechanism. So that seems to suggest that the public international law doesn't really need to play so much a role. But increasingly also, if you look at climate change, we see other aspects intersecting. Uh, we see human rights intersecting a lot and to constitutional rights, particularly in the field of climate change litigation. And that is linked to the foundations of the climate change abatement commitments undertaken in the Paris Agreement, for instance. But uh, litigants are using that uh, and then launching challenges based on human rights, for example, or provisions within the European uh, Convention of Human Rights. Um, and so you do need, therefore, that, that seems to me to suggest the other end of the spectrum, that you need to continue, continue the, the public international lawyer, the generalist public international lawyer, continues to play a role. And this is linked to one of the trends which perhaps we would 
uh, I hope we can touch on later, which is the increasing uh, complexity um, and intersection uh, of public, different public international disciplines. Uh, it's a more complex world um, and more considerations come into the mix rather than a siloed approach. Uh, so because we see less, there is a need that we see this thematic uh, convergence of different disciplines, that seems to me to call for uh, the continued need for generalist public international law lawyer, even in what one considers a very specialized subject. Absolutely, and I, and I think that some of the, uh, um, I think, uh, very recent developments regarding possible involvement of generalist or specialist dispute settlement bodies in the field, I think that, that that's probably something that we'll get to in a minute. I think I wanted to introduce uh, two questions from the audience uh, before we get there, because we have two very interesting questions, which I think both hang together a bit uh, in that they, uh, ask about intersections uh, between the roles of governmental international lawyers and a certain other. So uh, Paula Nuno Balmakeda, and my apologies if I mispronounce, asks about the intersections between the uh, governmental practitioner and the academic world. Mm. Uh, so are there challenges in the dialogues between perhaps the more practical perspective of the uh, governmental practitioner and the more academic theoretical perspectives of the academic. Uh, and I think uh, a different, but I mean, again, I think against on that raw confusion point, uh, Suraj Pratim Saiki, and again, I apologize if I mispronounce the name, uh, notes the sort of the, uh, the lawyer uh, diplomat uh, distinction where does the line of the uh, separation uh, uh, lies, and uh, and they suggest that perhaps uh, you know, in, in perhaps in, in very general assumptions of all the role, uh, lawyer might be perhaps a bit more calmer and detached, <laughs> perhaps a bit more sort of involved and uh, possibly a bit more confrontational. Uh, so, as it were, a governmental international lawyer on the one side academics, on the other side diplomats, where where do the lawyers fall? <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks, Martin. Two very, very interesting questions. And I must be careful how I couch this because I do not want to offend the academics or the practitioners on the call. Uh, and, and I have a happy position to be in wearing both hats at the moment. So my views are completely objective and neutral. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I do think it, it, so one of the points, one of the roles I mentioned earlier uh, of a government legal advisor is that of a treaty negotiator. And that is where I think the, the interface with a the diplomatic, the diplomacy, the practice of diplomacy becomes, comes to the fore because you can, you need to interact, uh, you need to exercise diplomacy in order to execute the mandate. Um, of course, one thinks of the lawyer as being, uh, you know, confrontational, uh, you know, banging the table in order to get um, your, uh, your outcome. Um, I don't personally share that philosophy and that really has not been the majority of my interactions with my counterparts in the negotiating field. Um, because you were effectively as a negotiator, you're a representative of the state, you have to hold yourself up um, to, to a certain professionalism and standing. And my personal uh, experience has been you achieve little by being diligent. You, you are far more effective uh, when you first, number one, establish a rapport with your counterpart. Um, human nature being what it is, if you, don't, if you like your counterpart, you will try and achieve an outcome that will satisfy both of us. Uh, that's just human nature. If the other part is doing nothing but banging the table and being belligerent and rude, um, I probably will be less inclined to listen. Uh, it's, just, it's just a human nature. It, it, you know, it takes a, a, a bigger person to re cut, listen, you know, cut through all that uh, background noise and to get to the core. So I would say this comes down to saturate to my point about what is the role of a treaty negotiator and, and vis a vis the role of the diplomat. You basically have to be both a lawyer and a diplomat. You do your best to achieve the intended outcome uh, in a manner consistent with your country's standing. So in the case of Singapore, for example, we've always been a supporter of multilateralism and rule of law. So the way you conduct yourself, you know, to be a bridge builder, to be constructive, 
Now, this is particularly important for smaller countries, very practical for the continued maintenance and functioning of the bilateral relation. Rule of law is important. Now, of course, I'm realistic. I mean, that, well, that may have been my personal guiding principle as a negotiator. This approach, I'm aware, may differ for other states. States with who are more powerful may be guided by other considerations. And that plays out in the approach, um, in the way tables, proposals are tabled, in the way negotiations are conducted. But that's the reality. Um, as a negotiator, those are the realities you work with. These are associated with the typical balance of bargaining power and real politics. A good negotiator will be aware of that. You will be mindful of that. Um, and you need to identify and create opportunities for some sort of leveling, leveling up, some sort of a basis for trade-off and package, um, either within the issues in negotiating or outside to, to generate the conditions that will allow for this meeting of minds. But that's essentially a diplomatic role, but also very much a legal role because you need to be able to identify the legal parameters, craft the language, propose the language, um, and this interaction uh, uh, has a secondary benefit because you, these are excellent opportunities to form the networks and the relationship that will serve you very well in a long-term career in, in the public international law field. Now, on the second point, on the academics, uh, hmm, that's a tricky one, um, you know, because I think both serve a role. Um, and the way in which the roles are discharged is also dictated by the uh, conditions under which they work. And I, I believe Judge Donahue also touched on that. Because as a legal advisor, you are, you, there is a, a huge demand on your time um, and also a certain expediency in discharging the advice that may be needed within a couple of hours. And so it's sort of being short, succinct to the point, getting to the core. Um, I can only relate to my own experience and, and of course there were many times as a government legal advisor I wish I had time to sit down um, and, and you know delve into more uh, the, into the intricacies and the deeper foundations um, of the legal principles that will be very important um, in the analysis of the issue. I simply do not have the time and that is where the, again the, a good working relationship with an, acad with an academic or a faculty that can uh, perhaps address that part of the necessary legal analysis um, that a legal advisor who's you know, basically busy 24 seven may not have the time to do so. Uh, so how do you then, um, the, the trick of course is always the translation. As I mentioned earlier, this, the trick is the translation, translating the legal principles and the analysis into a practical, uh, workable, understandable advice uh, that a policy agency can run uh, with, because the policy agents uh, guys are typically not, many are not lawyers, uh, and they do not have the time of the day to be a 10 page analysis. They want something that's succinct. And that is where the, the lawyer plays a good interface between perhaps the, the deeper academic research that is a necessary part of the equation and the translation to the practical uh, elements for the policy makers. Now, it is a different skill set. Some individuals are blessed with the ability to do both, uh, but not everybody is that fortunate. Some are excel in one um, and some excel in the other. So it's a question of uh, tapping on the resources that you have. Yeah. Well, that is, uh, that, I think that was, that was ex helpful and, uh, and extremely, extremely illuminating. And thank you as well for the excellent questions. I think if we can, Link back perhaps to the uh, uh, to the uh, well. I think that it's before we get on. I think I just saw uh, Mamadou Ebi from Leiden uh, asking a typical insightful question. So I wonder whether we could just sort of finish off with that one before we move to the complexity of international law. And Mamadou says that scholars have often argued that government lawyers have a special responsibility, and let me just say that there are air quotes around that, towards international law, uh, taking into account the process of creation, adjudication, and enforcement of norms in this legal order. Uh, so the idea of lawyers, again, quote unquote, as guardians of international mm -hmm. law. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, does it, uh, 
might it have had any concrete impact in the manner that you would have performed your duties as a governmental lawyer? So I suppose in short, the idea that your client is not just the state or the minister, as Judge Donahue put, but perhaps in some way, the broader community of international lawyers or international community more generally. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, it is, it is an important question um, as to the role um, of a lawyer as a guardian of the law uh, or the guardian of the constitution, so to speak, whether or not you operate in the domestic sphere or you operate in the international sphere. Um, there is this uh, one, one notion um, that the role um, is also not, it's not simply to advance or what the policy makers or decision makers would like as an objective, but also to ensure, I would say guardianship of the law. Uh, how do you do that? Um, may vary from place to place and depending on the context. So for an example, um, uh, just a, a hypothetical example, there may be a policy, uh, maybe the example I gave at the beginning about uh, the export bans on uh, or restrictions on PPE equipment. Um, and so the issue, what one can imagine in looking at that, um, how do you, you have to take a position that champions the discipline and framework of the structure of international law, uh, because erosion of those principles where while convenient in one instance, could have repercussions in another situation. So being the guardian of the international framework, uh, that is one aspect of being a guardian of the international framework because you are very mindful of, uh, of a very careful, robust um, defense of obligations that has been agreed on and committed to in the past. Uh, and as a supporter of rule of law and multilateralism, uh, one must be very careful um, to avoid any sort of a flagrant violation of those or disregard of those rules. And I would say that, I would say generally governments are very mindful of that. Generally governments do not want to be in flagrant violations of the international law obligations. Very few would be openly say that or demonstrate that because it can easily boomerang back on them in other, in other fields. And as international law, you do have to uphold that um, and, 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 and do that very robustly. Um, but it is sometimes easier said than done because you are faced with competing, very valid, very legitimate competing uh, policy considerations. Um, and that equation, that balancing of policy considerations is really often the remit of the policy uh, uh, officials, not the legal officials. Although the legal counsels do have a responsibility to flag these uh, consequences. Um, offer a suggestion, offer a way to mitigate the risk um, or to remove the risk entirely, to divert the risk, so to speak. Um, and, and, but ultimately it is again, the policy individuals, officials who will uh, make the final call. This is the same in any legal system. Uh, so the advocacy that is internally is important. Now you often will not see this obviously because this, this, this internal advocacy is in, indoors. And again, Josh Nunn Hugh mentioned that uh, before any you know, before any outward um, articulation of a policy or decision behind that would 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 have uh, would have been hours of consultations and deliberations and considerations that would not be made public. But rest assured that whatever decision that's out there would have taken into account all these considerations. Thank you, and I, and I think it again it echoes one of the points that Judge Donahue made about the confidentiality, um, and that I think was a, one of the similarities that she thought we should show work, you know, a great deal of work behind the scenes. Uh, let us perhaps interlink then back to the so the point that 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 you raised when we we're talking about uh, climate change law mm -hmm. and so the idea of complexity and fields, you know, generalist fields, human rights, international court, domestic litigation, and perhaps, perhaps, you know, pulling out from the particular examples, perhaps even there's a bit of a long durée point to be made uh, from the perspective of your experience over the last 25 years about, you know, directions of international law. Mm. 
Um, yeah, certainly I'm happy, happy to address that. Uh, and perhaps for one aspect, it depends on interest, is really the skill sets required of an international lawyer. Because again, I think this tracks the evolution and it just tracks the world. Um, but in the interest of time, I will just touch very briefly on the different skill sets, which some may be called upon more than in other scenarios. We've talked about legal expertise, general and deep. We've touched on that. that. I think another point that's important is a subject matter domain knowledge and a curiosity, if I could put it that way. But what do I mean by that? Um, I mean, the world is just more complex. We have issues of cyber. We have issues of artificial intelligence. Uh, for some of us, for some of us, <laughs> it's a confession. For some of us, those terms didn't even exist in public international law uh, literature, uh, you know, when we started out. So you do need to have this natural curiosity to look at to understand the technical subject matter. Uh, for climate change, honestly, you have to be able to be open and to understand the science behind it. So it calls for extra legal skills um, to, to first understand that. Um, understanding the processes. And if you're dealing with an international organization, the ability to understand the processes and procedure is important because procedure can sometimes be used as a tool in negotiations. So that's important. Diplomatic skills, we talked about that. And of course, certainly the creativity is, is necessary. Um, in coming up with creative solutions. And that comes up to the fore very much in negotiations or even in uh, negotiations for dispute settlement, where you have to come up with alternative creative language that will convey the nuances, uh, provide the necessary ambiguity that will satisfy both sides. Now, one controversial recent example was the language of phase out or phase down of coal and fossil, fossil fuel subsidies in Glasgow. And they have very different meanings. Uh, one is a complete phase out, one is a phase down. Uh, the end point may be the same, but the timeline is different. Uh, but it allows for uh, uh, what, what would otherwise have held, held up the resolution or the conclusion of decision one of, of CP26. So those are examples of where you want to exercise some nimbleness and creativity. Uh, you may criticize the outcome, but that did um, allow consensus to, to take place. So ability to exercise risk. Uh, project management, of course, is very important, particularly when you're managing negotiations and disputes. So when you talk about, um, let's say, what are the changes and the trends? Um, and there are a couple of trends. I mean, one I think we touched on earlier, the fragmentation and expansion of international law in different sub-disciplines. Um, and how do you then uh, make sure that the developments in one is a coherent, and aligned from the state's perspective. This does bring increasing challenges um, for in terms of legal oversight over all treaty negotiations. How do you maintain consistency and compatibility when you have multiple negotiations, some specialized, some not so in different fields, and sometimes they intersect with different teams? Uh, so the question really is, uh, are there structures within each government? And I'm sure there are, it's just in a different way that allows for this sort of a centralized oversight, even when the functions are dispersed among different, different agencies. And this is a very real, real case. How do you ensure that? Um, in the field of trade agreements, one typical uh, commentary has really been the, what we call spaghetti bowl and proliferation of FTAs, uh, and sometimes proliferation involving the same trade partner, but having two or three overlapping trade agreements, maybe one bilateral, one regional, and one plurilateral, for instance. And so that does bring about its own challenges in making sure that there are common understandings uh, with your counterparts in regard to the previous agreements. Um, and, and in the TPP negotiations, for example, we had a really gargantuan task of trying to unify uh, the multiple states and the diverse economic and political systems into, into doing that. So the devices such as use of footnotes for greater uh, certainty footnotes, um, the use of uh, innovative devices like a drafter's note, which is not quite a treaty text, not quite a travel, but nonetheless an agreed drafter's note. Uh, as a signpost to tribunals uh, in the interpretation of a treaty. Um, in this case, uh, for example, the like circumstances uh, uh, and the interpretation of like circumstances in the investment chapter. 
So that's one, right? Um, so again, relating to fragmentation, we talked about the complexity and the intersections across disciplines, even if there is expansion as per specialization within the disciplines. And so the, the, the ability of the legal advisor to really be adept and to be able to put on that broad lens is, is important because there are issues of accountabilities. Um, you have to manage the risk of litigation, dispute settlement um, in how certain clauses are read. And, and that's in different agreements, in different contexts that use the same term. So that's, that's important. Um, nowadays, technological development allows us to do, I would say, due diligence, um, investigations into the positions taken by counterparts. But much better record keeping nowadays, uh, much more transparency uh, as well in some, in some countries. So the ability to look into each other's domestic systems is important as well. So there is a plus and a minus in the sense that you're able to probe and understand uh, the positions and the real concerns and real restrictions in a counterpart uh, jurisdiction than before. But it also means that you also, there is also um, less ability to obfuscate uh, in your negotiation. So again, plus and minus, depending on which way you look at uh, the position. Could I, could I ask, and I think it is something that we have sort of touched upon, but, you know, uh, very happy to ask in very open-ended terms because that is of great practical relevance. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I suppose really the ten a bit of a tension between universal institutions and specialized institutions and mm -hmm. to bring in the implementation and compliance uh, committee. Uh, on the one hand, an institution that has been crafted to specifically reflect the institutional balance within the specialized regime on the one hand, and on the other hand, universal bodies, uh, whether the International Court of Justice or the International Tribunal of Law of the Sea, which might consider it from a more generalist international law perspective, but in a way, as it were, standing outside the internal institutional balance that is struck there. And you know, again, something that is very much of practical relevance within the field, if any any thoughts about that, I suppose the balance between the specialist and the universal uh, institutions for addressing things. Um, I don't have a come down to a firm view of that. To be honest, uh, there is a role for both. Um, an, an example of the very specialized um, and well function and, and long functioning. Uh, some, some would disagree that it's well-functioning, but certainly long-functioning um, is the WTO dispute settlement. There is own body of laws and a very, very long uh, and uh, established case by jurisprudence as well. And it has its own place. I mean, I don't think anyone would deny that it has its own place in the field of trade law. Um, the question uh, has always been, and again, we see that in, in investment um, arbitration context, Right, because it, it is a very specialized, almost confined interpretation of treaty uh, provisions in the bilateral investment treaty or uh, the investment chapter of the FTA. Um, and the long, the specialization does provide a level of, um, I would say, very advanced, uh, very in depth analysis. One of the, the, the question, though, is that. Um, can that really continue um, without regard to other developments from a public international law uh, field? And there is no clear answer to that. Although we have seen criticisms of, of that sort of insularity, um, particularly in the earlier days of the um, investor state tribunals, decisions, um, particularly touching on the area of minimum standard of treatment and fair and equitable, uh, minimum standard of treatment and fair and equitable treatment, um, and the ability or not so much the ability, but the tendency of the uh, investment tribunal to, to almost decide without regard to customary international law principles of MST. So that has been the earlier, um, uh, 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 more recent, earlier this criticisms over this more, in, more specialized regime 
and really the recognition that there is scope and it can be uh, uh, the decisions reached can be more grounded perhaps if there is a better reference or a wider reference uh, to uh, the customary international law principles that has developed in the general PIL field. So I'm just recalling that as an example where I think the, the jury is probably still out, uh, where one can see a, a greater need uh, for the involvement of public international law and the relevance of public international law principles into certain specialized fields, where in other areas, uh, let's say interpretation of say Article 6, the carbon market rules, which are very, very technical, in those areas that, that perhaps maybe one can see less, less relevance apart from the general principles of treaty interpretation, let's, let's see. Um, so I think the jury is out and I do think uh, it really depends uh, on the context. Uh, like you mentioned cyber earlier, right? And, and cyber is again, another field which is uh, very, it's almost in its, its own space in terms of cyber. But increasingly now when you talk the, the, the narrative and the dialogue international discussions about cyber, one, it does not get away and cannot get away from the classical notions and in fact, the, the discussions over the applicability of uh, the rules regarding the use of force and self-defense in the cyber context. Um, and, and again, those are classic public international law issues, but they do, we see that having a very real relevance in a subfield like, like cyber because of the implications and because of the effects that it can, it can have. Um, so it is not an easy answer. Uh, and in, and there have, even in the trade fund, we have seen uh, questions over uh, whether an interpreta interpretation by, by uh, say a tribunal, an FTA tribunal or a WTO tribunal that only looks at the WTO rules without uh, regard to existing obligations that may exist in the FTA context or are some other context between these two parties that in the real world would have a bearing on the overall balance of international law commitments and obligations. In the real world, one would have to take all that into account. As a, as a public international lawyer, you would have to take that into account in the equation, in the balancing. Um, so when you translate that to a tribunal, um, uh, why would that not also be the case? But to be fair, the tribunals are also circumscribed by the mandates that they are given. And if the mandates and the competencies that were given were clearly circumscribed, then there's really also nothing much that the particular tribunal members can do unless the parties to that treaty or an agreement are prepared to uh, adjust or modify it. Or unless the evolution of public international law principles, even within that space, allow for that sort of uh, evolution, if I could put it that way. Yeah. So, sorry, no clear answer to that. Uh, no, and, and, and I mean, I think that that, uh, that that I suppose must be the right answer. I suppose a sort of uh, a hedged answer, uh, much depends on the institution, much depends on the field, much depends on the framing, as you very rightly said, the mandate, uh, jurisdictional and applicable law authority. Well, I think that we could probably go on for hours and hours, but I wondered whether in, in a sort of in a concluding sense for a few minutes, uh, because I see that in the audience we have uh, where the next uh, and the generation after that of public international lawyers who may be thinking of a governmental career as one of the options, uh, perhaps sort of any, any sort of crystal ball thoughts of uh, what to do, uh, what not to do, uh, again, in a most most open-ended way. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm afraid I don't have so pearls of wisdom, uh, but for anyone who's thinking of a career in the public international law sphere, um, just you need more, more important than anything else is really to have an open mind and, a, and an intellectual curiosity about all things. Not just law, but also, uh, other aspects of, uh, of law. Why do I say that? Because increasingly um, international law, which used to be the domain of just state actors, is no longer just the domain of state actors. Um, you see the increasing role and uh, an influence of non-state actors, corporates, NGOs, 
um, uh, particular, you know, for example, in Glasgow, we saw the um, what we call the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which is a really a global coalition of leading financial institutions. Um, and advocating investor actions, initiating moves to make sure that they, in, the, in their conduct with their financial transactions, they are moving towards, they make sure that it is a net zero. So although this is started by, uh, let's say, financial institutions, uh, it, it effectively, if one could put it that way, it's sort of establishing a norm, isn't it? Because who are the players in the financial industry, right? These are the banks, these are the hedge fund managers, these are the investors. Uh, and they are among themselves establishing that sort of a, of a regime. So I think increasingly many MNCs and many large corporates have, uh, have large departments uh, that are solely dedicated to government policy and international relations. So it just shows how much they're getting in that space. So it is not no longer just the exclusive domain of states. And I think corporates is another. So I think for anyone looking into that area, you need to be aware of what the corporates are doing. Um, and while we talked about law and norm making, one thing I didn't touch upon today uh, was is the increasing influence of soft law and soft law instruments. Um, and they could take the form of model, model rules, they could take the form of declarations or the ILC draft articles, for instance, because there is an, another, another example uh, where really because of the, the difficulties um, in recent years of universal uh, multilateral norm making activities. Uh, there is an increasing recourse to such instruments, as well as an increasing recourse to multi plurilateral initiatives, which is a small group of countries of the like-minded, starting off catalyzing certain actions in the hope of gaining momentum and wider influence and, and, and uptake. Um, positive development or not, I think uh, the, from a systemic point of view, uh, it, it remains to be seen. I, I can understand, I can, there are certainly benefits in a smaller group of countries push, which are already pushing initiatives first, who are ready, uh, you see that in the WGO in terms of the plurilateral discussions on say e-commerce and things like that. We saw that recently in Glasgow where there were a lot of, a lot of small uh, initiatives launched by small groups of countries. Uh, for example, the coal and gas alliance that's going to stop all forms of fossil fuel uh, exploitation and, ex and, uh, and exploration within the jurisdictions. We saw the Clydeback Declaration, which where a smaller group, again, a small group of countries uh, were making commitments in relating to establishment of what they call green shipping lanes. So only you know, green shipping lanes between ports. And so you see these initiatives that can help move the conversation forward. But the question always is, would it leave everyone else behind? Um, and so again, it's good in moving the world forward on in dealing with a global crisis. But again, one needs to one needs to also consider the inclusivity and making sure everybody else is given the uh, empowered also to address that challenge. This is the rise of soft law again um, is not to be minimized because they can be simple, but they can also can be very complex, and they certainly have the potential to become uh, to, to to really become binding law in the future. Uh, and so it is a issue that I think, well, international lawyers will also need to pay heed to um, and not um, leave it to uh, say the policy agencies because, oh, it's non-binding, so I don't need to worry about it. Uh, that's certainly no longer the case. Um, and those are again issues that I think any, uh, any aspiring international lawyer would want to, uh, to look out for. So I hope that helps. Uh -oh. Well, I'm sure that it is enormously helpful. And I think that my takeaway is really uh, never to lose intellectual curiosity, uh, the passion for the infinite variety of international law within government, but also I think as we heard very much beyond government, beyond formal international law, beyond formal state actors, uh, international law is everywhere and intellectual curiosity should ideally take you there. Well. I can only once again uh, thank Daniele for the really utterly formidable tour de force uh, performance, uh, clearly underpinned by an incredible amount of uh, uh, practical experience delivered with a wonderfully light touch. Uh, let me thank again our persevering audience as well, and of course our wonderful Kat Balogun um, from uh, the events team.
Uh, many thanks, and I am sure that we will see each other at some point, either in the virtual space or the real world, international or the brands. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.